Ladies and gentlemen, your world is teeming with life, and especially microbial life. Everywhere on Earth we look, we find them. Now I'm sure you can all think of obvious places where microbial life can occur. Examples are the ocean, the lake close to your home, the soil in your garden, and everybody's skin. But what about unexpected places? Places where one would not believe life to exist, and yet it does. One of these places I would like to discuss with you today, namely oil fields. Surprisingly, microbial life flourishes kilometers beneath our feet, in the deposits that hold the oil and gas that we use to power our society. Yes, microbes even beat us at exploiting fossil fuels, taking out the energy it contains. And make a decent living. I argue that there is a lot we can learn from these microbes that call oil fields their home, and in fact, they might be able to help us make oil field operations just a little cleaner. Because we globally consume 67 million barrels of oil per day, 4,000 Olympic swimming pools each and every day. Now, oil fields are fascinating ecosystems. And one could call them extreme, partly belonging to an older Earth, and that is what makes them so fascinating to a petroleum microbiologist like me. But before we dive into the world of oilfield microbes, we first need to explore oilfields themselves. Here you look from Holland over the border into Germany, and you see those pump jacks standing around, maybe a lost tank or two. I guess this is familiar to most. But what now lies underneath? Underneath, you can find a variety of things. First, a cap rock, an impermeable rock layer that is containing everything, holding everything in place. Underneath that, there is a gas cap, because when the oil was formed over geological times, the lighter hydrocarbons have moved up, and the lower ones have moved down. So underneath the gas cap, then there is the oil phase, and underneath that, there is water, lots of it, so-called formation water. And all of that is based on source rock. Now, all of these liquids and gases are not contained in some kind of gigantic underground cavern. No, they are contained in something called porous reservoir rock. And it looks a little bit similar to this sponge. And all those liquids are contained in those tiny little pores, and see very high pressures due to the compressed gases. Oil fields are also elevated in temperature. Between 50 and 90 degrees C, and many of them are saltier than the sea. Very important it is to mention that oil fields are depleted of oxygen. Fantastic lifestyle, don't you think? But these microorganisms make it so. The fact that oxygen is absent gives rise to different types of microbiological breeding. Some microorganisms can breed on sulfate, for example, or iron, or some can breed. On CO2, the stuff that we actually exhale. Now, when humans come along and drill into the oil reservoir, the oil starts to flow out naturally due to the expansion of the compressed gases. It's a bit similar to the Coke bottle you dropped on the floor effect. But when this, when there is enough liquid taken out and this flow diminishes, then what people do? Well, they pump in seawater to maintain that pressure and keep producing the oil. And therefore, oil field water has two sources: one, the formation water, and two, the seawater that we pump in. And a complex set of tanks, pipelines, separators, flotation units, filters, when the oil is flowing to the surface, is now needed to separate the water from that oil again. Not to mention the amount of chemical treatment that goes in here. Now, each of these elements represents a unique environment and holds its own microbial inhabitants. So, what can we now expect from these oil field microbes? Well, first we must be honest and say that these microbes can cause problems to the oil field operations. One of these problems is bio corrosion. Normal chemical corrosion is a process that is nothing more than rust formation when oxygen is present, 
And it is, in other words, slow burning of metal. It happens chemically all the time. It's just too slow for our eyes to see it. To prove this to you, this is steel wool, a cleaning tool containing soap and very thin threads of iron. And if I loosen that up a little bit, the surface-to-volume ratio to the iron is now so large that the corrosion becomes burning, and we can actually see it happen. Now, a variety of microorganisms can harvest this energy, also when oxygen is not present. And this is what makes this process very unpredictable. This is a hole in a pipeline, caused by the effects of microbes. Now, when oil field engineers design pipelines and tanks, they typically meant to last for 30 to 40 years. But when this certain type of microbial iron-consuming organisms are present, they can speed up this chemical process by a factor of 10, leading to pipeline failures and leakages very early on, and all the associated problems one might imagine. Another issue is the formation of dehydrogen sulfide. You know that old egg in your closet that you thought, "Ah, oh, throw this away." That's the stuff what I'm talking about. When we introduce seawater into the reservoir, we also introduce sulfate, and a variety of microorganisms can utilize this sulfate together with the oil to make a living. But their byproduct is this smelly and toxic gas. How bad is this now, actually? Well. H2S is inherently toxic. It doesn't belong in our oxygenic atmosphere. And each and every year, several people get injured due to H2S exposure. On top of that, it is also highly corrosive, leading to biocorrosion, as I've shown before. And the oil industry is producing now so much that it needs to be converted to elemental sulfur, which nobody wants, leading to these gigantic mountains of sulfur scattered across the world. So by now you're beginning to wonder. Okay, this just sounds like one huge issue to me. How can you call this now fascinating? Well, because we might be able to transform this microbial challenge into an opportunity if we are smart. And in order to do this, we need to go back in time to the year 1934, where two microbiologists mentioned everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. What did Becking and Byring mean at that time? They basically said every microbe is everywhere, but the environment places restrictive conditions upon itself, allowing only a few of these microorganisms to flourish and become dominant. And that when conditions change, new microorganisms are now better suited for those environmental conditions and will flourish and become dominant at the expense of others. By using this old principle, we can that now turn that now into an information source, and we can add to that. What is selected tells something about the environment, and this is especially convenient when an environment is close to our eyes, in case of the tank or the pipe, or is buried beneath our feet, in case of the oil field itself. Oil fields change all the time; temperature drops, salinity changes, and first and foremost, also the chemicals that we apply. But we cannot see microbes. So then, what do we do? Well, we open up the molecular biology toolbox and we peek into their genetic material, their DNA, because a water sample is easily obtained. So we take a water sample from all these environments and send them to a lab and test them. And the information that comes back tells us roughly who is there, but also what their activities might be. By using this as an information source, we can detect issues with H2S and corrosion very early on. But on top of that, as a bonus, we also get information about chemical performance and system status. How does this now look in practice? Here we have an oil field which is marine in nature. The produced oil water comes up and is sent to a separator tank. Here the oil is floated off by flotation, and the water is being re-prepared for re-injection. Into the reservoir. Two things happen in between these two tanks. At first, the temperature is heated from 45 to 65 degrees, and the water, in order to be re-injected, needed to be made less salty. But how do we make water less salty? Well, they put in tap water, but tap water contains oxygen, which is corrosive, which is what we do not want. So a chemical is added called sulfite to scavenge that oxygen. But the reaction product of sulfite and oxygen is sulfate. This is the difference between these two tanks. 
If we now look at the microbial environment in tank number one, we see that 50 percent of the microbial population consists of a commensal organism type called Marinobacter. You can also find them, you know, in oil-polluted marine seawater. But in the second tank, where we are adding the sulfite, all of a sudden, 40 percent of the microbial population consists of a bacterial type called Thermo de Sulfo Vibrio. Let's dissect that name. Thermo, meaning it grows under warm conditions. De Sulfo Vibrio, meaning it's a sulfate eater that forms sulfide, which is what we didn't want. And notice thereby that the microbial population indeed is a reflection of the environment. And in this case, we advised to minimize the amount of ammonium bisulfite added, so there is less of our De Sulfo Vibrio friends around. In other cases, oil field owners have been able to significantly optimize and read therein, reduce and optimize their chemical spend. Have been able to reduce the amount of interventions needed on the oil field, meaning system shutdown because of some kind of operational issue, and have also been able to detect small leaks into their system. So, as you can see, there is stuff that we can learn from these microorganisms that call oil fields their home. Early on detection of issues. And two, optimization of chemical performance, and thereby indeed make oil field operations just a little cleaner. Who knows what other secrets they may hold for us? Thank you so much.